Who would win in a fight, a rhino or a shark? That's a question by Forever Drift. Obviously, the only real winner in that is going to be the person recording it because their YouTube channel is going to blow up. Hey everyone, welcome to this video and this is the big Q&A session and it was the thank you for reaching 15,000 subscribers. Now since I put that call out for the questions, we've gained another 10,000 subscribers on top of that, which is absolutely amazing for the channel. The channel's just going from strength to strength now, it's really starting to snowball and gather momentum. So I just want to firstly say thank you to everyone that's took part in this Q&A video. Thanks for the Instagram messages, the emails, I put loads of them together, I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. So with all that said guys, let's not waste any more time and get straight into it. So Psycat Debnerth says, tattoos on dark skin, what type of design should I choose? What type of colour should I choose? Shading techniques, etc. What I find is with really dark skin, you tend to get more limited to the, the finer, more subtle shades. So if you're tattooing someone with really, really dark skin, um, personally for me, what I do is tend to stick to the more bolder, basic colors. So if I'm tattooing someone with really dark skin, I'd probably just use um, a dynamic black and a really dark gray wash and sort of offset and try and make that as contrasty as possible. But trying to put um, really light shades and subtle shades of gray wash and really dark skin doesn't really work, especially when the tattoo has healed. So next question is by Barry Noon. When I do shading, sometimes the skin reddens up real quick what would cause this am i too rough or too fast etc now i do cover this um, a lot more in depth on another video um, so i stick that card up on the screen but basically it can be a number of things if the skin is going really really red uh, and angry looking when you're shading it can be uh, your machine hitting too hard it can be using cheap ink cheap needles it can be your techniques not right it can be your hand speed and your machine speed aren't matched up with each other so it can be a whole range of things um, without actually watching your tattoo um, it's impossible to say but if you do check that video out if you've not seen it already that should put you on the right path um, to getting those nice smooth shades and not that angry red looking skin so our next question is by Triple F Go. What's your favorite part of the tattoo process? Now, without doubt, my favorite part of the tattoo process is at the very end when you've wiped down and then the client gets to look at their new tattoo in the mirror. Um, my favorite part of this is looking at the client's face um, when they're checking out the new tattoo. Um, and it's just the best feeling when you've got someone, um, you know, they've been sat there for sometimes all day uh, and then they finally look at the tattoo in the mirror and they're really, really pleased with it. It's a feeling I can't describe, but it's, it's one of the best feelings and it's uh, one of the more rewarding aspects of the job. So our next question is by Max Payne, cool name. I have a question, it's about the give. When the give is in the hard setting, do you set the voltage high or low? And when the give is in soft setting, do you set the voltage low? Especially when shading, and what about color packing? I have a machine here, and it's a dragonfly machine. Okay, so with the give, again, I do go into loads and loads of detail in another video about this. Uh, I'll stick the card up on the screen. But basically, the general consensus is, for shading and colour packing, personally for me, I have the give or the bog um, set so the machine hits quite soft uh, and when I'm lining I have the give set so it hits quite hard. That's just, ba that's just how I tattoo personally but I find I get the best results. So um, for lining, hard hitting machine, shading, colour packing, softer hitting machine. So our next question is by Third Fish. Jono, what computer editing software do you use for your tattoo tutorials? Well, I use only two programs. I use Adobe Premiere Pro and I use Adobe Photoshop. And I find those two programs are just so powerful uh, and they just work seamlessly with each other and literally cover all bases for what I need for my videos. So my next question is by Mamola Bodyby. Hope I've said that right. Why my tattoos heal grey in most cases, then after a month start disappearing? Right, 
really, really easy, this one. Um, if any tattoos are disappearing after a month, it's purely because they've not been put in right. So you probably not hit the right depth. You might have not um, used the right technique. You might have used cheap quality ink, but it can be a mixture of all those things. But in a nutshell, if your tattoos are falling out when they're healing, they've not been put in right. Next question, Hope H. What are good drawing exercises that you can suggest people should do to improve their art? And that's a good question. There's a couple of exercises that you can do. Uh, ones that I used to do, really, really simple exercise, but it'll help you massively, especially with your tattoo shading. And what I used to do is get my drawing pad and I'd literally start with um, like a dark pencil, like a 4B or a 6B, something like that, whatever I had to hand. Uh, and I'd start scribbling, um, making it as black as I can and then start coming down the page and start making it lighter and lighter till I eventually get to nothing. And I try and make the gradation of black to light so you can't see any um, choppy bits in it. So just one smooth transition from dark to light. And that's a really, really good technique that you can practice pretty much anywhere with pencil and paper. Next question is by Keisha Smith. My question is, can you share more info about achieving smoother shade and shading techniques to avoid choppy and overfilled areas? Not so much regarding CPS and hand speed, but more of me picking your brain to understand what you see and how you go about shading and filling a piece so hopefully I can learn and improve. Now, the thing is with smooth shading, like I've covered uh, in previous videos, is it's not just one aspect which is going to give you a smooth shade. It's a collection of um, elements that all need to be aligned to achieve that smooth shade. So I know you say on your question um, not regard CPS and hand speed but the fact is it's a, a really big part of the puzzle um, if you want to achieve smooth shade. So that really does have to play a part um, and then it goes down to quality ink, quality needles, technique, um, your machine not hitting too hard on the skin, and also knowing how to read the skin, uh, knowing when the skin's getting too red, uh, knowing to when to ease off a certain area and move to another area and then come back to that area. So lots of things working together is gonna get you the nice soft shading that you need. Next question is by Snazzy Shiver. I'm an aspiring tattoo artist from India could you gift me your reviewed machines? Um, I'm sorry, Snazzy. Giving my machines away would be like giving my children away. They just, they don't go anywhere. They stay with me. I, ca I can't part with them. Okay, next question is by WheelsX18. So I purchased a cold machine kit a month or so ago and I've done quite a bit of practice on fake skin. I decided to tattoo myself the other day and with it being my first time tattooing on skin and on myself, I was really nervous and kind of shaky hands at first and then it subsided. Although when tattooing on fake skin, I'm so relaxed with no problem. My question is, how do I relax before tattooing on skin? That's a really good question and it's something which I struggled with a lot, especially in the beginning uh, of my tattoo career. It's something where there's not a magic bullet and it's not a quick fix to sort. And I think having some nerves isn't necessarily a bad thing because it kind of shows that you are bothered about getting the tattoo right and it shows that you actually care enough that you're getting nervous about doing the tattoo. Now, the shaky hands and the, the feeling of trembling inside and I used to get, you know, hot face and all sorts of things like that. And I found it just slowly subsides with one, as your confidence grows up, the nerves will come down and two, just with time and experience. And the more experience and confidence that you gain, the less um, the nerves will be there. The nerves will always be there, don't get me wrong, because I mean, well, they still are for me personally anyway. I still get nervous over uh, doing uh, certain types of tattoos. Some tattoos make me more nervous than others. Um, for example, tribute tattoos tend to make me slightly more nervous 
than um, just doing a standard tattoo for someone because I think there's so much more meaning behind the tribute tattoo uh, and it's often for a lost family member or something like that. So there's just that added pressure on, you know, really, really nailing that tattoo and it being what the client really, really wants. So I think for tattoos, especially like that, you're always going to feel some kind of nervousness. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the business. Um, and anyone that says that they don't get nervous whatsoever when they're tattooing, they're probably lying. So our next question is from Telbo. Can you tell me why one of my lining machines stops running when I touch the needle bar, no matter what the voltage is? Thank you very much for your help in your videos. They have been a really good help for me, thank you. Okay, so let's say you've got this coal machine and you're running it and as soon as you're touching your thumb on the armature bar, you know, to test the hit and the give, it's stopping completely. This can be a number of things. It could be that you've got just too much of a big gap between the front contact screw and the front spring. But I'm guessing it's probably not that because that would have to be a seriously big gap and you probably notice that the gap is way too big. So my other guess would be, um, being as though the, the, you do mention regardless of the volts, um, it's still doing it, then I would ask, is it a cheap machine? Because if it's like a cheap, you know, cloned, copied machine from China that you get off eBay or Amazon, um, that's probably what it is. That's probably your answer right there. Because people time and time again say cheap machines are just as good as the branded ones, the expensive ones, and the expensive ones are just a rip off because, um, you know, you can get the, the exact same thing for a fraction of the price. And um, guys, take it from me. That is just not true. The expensive machines are expensive for a reason. It's because they're really well made. Um, the motors in them or the coils in them, you know, they're made with parts that last, uh, parts that are built to run, uh, to run all day in a, in a busy tattoo studio. And these cheap clone things that are kicked out in factories in China, they're just a complete waste of money, in my opinion anyway. Uh, you, you can probably run one and it, you, you, you might be able to kick out a few tattoos with them. But ultimately, um, if you want to be, you know, um, a professional tattoo artist, then that's not really the route that you need to be taking. Um, I personally have used cloned machines before to see what they're like and um, how they compare to the real thing. To give you an example of this, I got hold of a cloned Cheyenne Hawk pen uh, and I tested it against obviously my genuine one. I can tell you this with a degree of certainty and confidence that the only thing that both machines had in common was their looks. And that's where it starts and ends. They looked similar to each other, that was it. Even the weight of the machine was different. You know, the, the cloned one, it was almost twice as heavy as um, the original. And as for it running, it was absolutely terrible <laughs> so um if you are using um you know just a knockoff um chinese machine try uh saving up some money and getting yourself somewhat decent from a um, a reputable manufacturer a reputable machine builder and you'll probably notice a world of difference so next question is from graham bradley <laughs> Hey Jono, I'm a huge fan, been tattooing for two years now and your videos have raised my game and taught me so much. Do you have a Facebook page I can add you on? I do get this question quite a lot and um, to answer it um, quite bluntly I suppose and I don't mean any offence by it whatsoever is I tend to keep my personal life and my um, business life, YouTube life if you like um, two separate entities uh, and th there's reasons for this which I'll go into so on my personal Facebook page you know I've got my my family and my kids and my friends and things like that and then I've got my Instagram and my YouTube for things like this uh, and for answering questions now the reason I don't tend to add people that I don't know or you know people from YouTube onto my personal Facebook account is for a, a number of reasons but the main reason is is because I used to accept lots of friend requests on my Facebook account and they were from people like yourself from YouTube 
and my Facebook Messenger used to just go crazy. Uh, it could be like four o'clock in the morning, you know, three o'clock in the morning, ping, 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 and I'd just get bombarded with questions. Hey, Jono, I'm, you know, I'm just trying this. What do you think to this? How do you think I should do this? What do you think I should do with this? And if I didn't have that definite divide between my personal life and my business life, um, I probably would never sleep. And I do get it, you know, if, if someone's got a question, it's like, oh, well, that guy's on Facebook, I'll ask him. But when you've got this happening, you know, 30, 40, 50 times in a day, messages coming through, it would literally turn into a full-time job just answering messages. So yes, I have got a Facebook account, but I don't tend to add people that I don't really know on it. So hopefully you understand that and I don't come across as being some kind of douchebag or anything like that. But it is purely just because if I added everyone from YouTube and Instagram onto my Facebook account, I probably would never sleep again or be able to talk to my kids or wife ever again because I'd just be constantly answering messages. So that, that's why I keep it separate. So next question. This one's from Liam Winther. Do you blend your own colors or do you use gray wash? I used to make my own gray wash um, not for very long because it was just so inconsistent. And I know some people make it and they swear by it and some people get really good results with it, but I like to be consistent with every single tattoo and I like to know, you know, how many passes I'm gonna do with the needle is I'm gonna exactly get this particular shade that I want. I just found making your own gray washers just gave really inconsistencies uh, and there'd be a time where, you know, I'd make one quite um, a light shade say uh, and I get really light shades and then I thought I'd made it the same again the second time uh, and then I'd go for that light shade again it wouldn't be light it'd be a bit darker than usual and it could often throw my tattoos so nowadays well for years I've been using silverback uh, specifically the triple six series because it's nice and dark and that suits my style of tattooing. So the answer to your question is, no, I don't mix my own grey washers. Uh, and yes, I do buy them pre-mixed and I use the triple six series silverback. Next question is by Jared B. My question is one you probably heard often, but I've yet to really crack the code. I've done a few tattoos and it would be really helpful if there was an obvious way of knowing or practicing a technique that teaches and ensures proper depth. You hear nickel width or this or that, but I find it hard to concentrate on the piece itself because I worry about going too deep and then scarring. Some people, when they get really scared of going too deep, they tend to ride the tube. Um, I do cover this in another video, I'll stick that card up on the screen. But basically riding the tube is when you stick the needle out the tube just the depth that it's going into the skin. So let's say you hang your needle out the tube two millimeters and then you basically drag the tube along the skin. And it's kind of a little bit of a, a fail safe way of not going too deep, but it's got loads of limitations tattooing that way. Um, so I prefer to let my needle hang right outside the tube and con actually control the depth with my hand. Um, it does take a little bit more practice, but the only advice I really can give to you, because there's not really um, a method that you can do to practice getting this depth, um, the, the only advice I can give to you is really look at your lines that you pull in, because your lines uh, that you pull in are the, the biggest indication whether you're at the right depth or not. Uh, if it's blowing out, you're too deep. If it's looking really patchy and pitted, then you're too shallow. If your line's nice and solid and saturated, then you're probably at the right depth. And it's just getting that muscle memory uh, of knowing you know, how far to lower your machine into the skin. Uh, and it just comes with practice. So next question is <laughs> from Jason Porter. Do you know you sound just like Keith Lemon? I get this loads, uh, especially on YouTube. Um, anyone who doesn't know who Keith Lemon is, is a British comedian. Um, his real name's Lee Francis. I probably sound like him because he was literally born about 30 miles from uh, from where I live. He, he, he was born in Leeds. and uh, say Leeds is literally just down the road from me. That's probably why I sound like Keith Lemon. I did actually meet him once. I drew a picture of him and I got him to autograph it for me. And uh, yeah, he does sound very similar to me or I sound very similar to him. So if you do want my best Keith Lemon impression is, welcome to Celebrity Juice. There you go. Right, next one. We have 
Hannah Stavely. You effortlessly make fun of your haters in such a comical way in your videos and just wonder, do negative and abusive comments have an impact on you or do you really just laugh them off? Well, Hannah, um, <laughs> if I'm being 100% honest with you, um, at the beginning when I first did start YouTube, um, it did used to upset me um, when, you know, when, when someone had, had write, you know, oh man, you you know, you crap or whatever, and, you know, go kill yourself or all these other things. Um, but then I, I quickly got my head around it and, and just thought, you know, I've got to have a little bit of responsibility here as well, because if I'm putting myself out there on YouTube, then I've got to expect to get at least some hatred um, because that's just the way the world is. It's where the internet is. And I can thankfully say, you know, the love massively outweighs the hate. And nowadays I, j I just find it boring, to be honest. It's, I don't even find it funny. I just find it boring. Um, you get these tattoo police, like police in the internet, you know, and I, I just imagine them all meeting up and going around together like, keyboard warriors and you know telling everyone how it's going to be and how crap everyone is and all the rest of it and to be honest when when anyone any any writes anything like that on my channel it just bores the life out of me I don't take it to heart I certainly don't sit there thinking oh no you know I better not do this anymore because some guy who's probably middle-aged and lives in his mum's cellar and sits naked watching his train sets as said he doesn't like my tattoos you know it, it just it doesn't bother me it just bores me next question is by floral and macabre <laughs> cool name i'm an apprentice in my first year and i don't know anything about anything at all i guess i try as hard as i can but i feel defeated because my teacher in my shop told me everything i draw is super easy and every tattoo could do it but I'm just as bad and it doesn't work out as I wish it would. I wanted to ask you what machine you use for my style of drawings. Maybe a coil, but which one? I have a rotary FKN's Halo 2, but simply doesn't work for me. I take hours for lines because it punches them in so slow. My teacher told me to buy the specific machine for my style and spend nearly a thousand euros on the whole equipment. Also, I tried to change my style of drawing because I simply cannot tattoo it. I'm at the point where I think I'm simply too bad. I really want the customers to love their tattoos for the rest of their lives. I really hope you can help me. I can help you with this. It sounds like your mentor is a complete douchebag. Um, and that's pretty much all I've got to say about it. If, um, if your mentor is supposed to be teaching you and showing you, know, you how to tattoo and all he's doing is saying, you know, you're crap and anyone can do this and I, d I don't know what your problem is and words to that effect anyway. So let's look at it like this. Your mentor is telling you, which you are his apprentice, that, you know, this stuff is super, super basic and you can't tattoo it still and you're really bad. But if this stuff is really, really basic and he's your mentor, and you still can't tattoo this really, really basic stuff, then that says more about your mentor than it does you. Because that says to me that the teacher hasn't been able to teach his student the most basic of tasks. So I'd stop feeling defeated, I'd stop de feeling deflated, and I would leave that apprenticeship completely and go and find another one. Um, because like I say, he just sounds like a complete douchebag and you don't need him in your life. Uh, and just carry on with your journey and let's get that positivity back and build that confidence again. On to the next question. This one's by Art in Tattoo. Hi bro, thank you for your videos, I'm learning a lot. I have a question about needles for packing colour, only black. Which size and needles is better? 0.35s, 0.3s or 0.25s? Magnum or curved mags? So, 0.35s are the industry standard, 0.3s are double zeros, and 0.25s are bug pins. I'll cover all this in the video, I'll stick the card up on the screen. Um, for me personally, I mean, all these needles will work, and there'll be different people that'll give you different answers, but in short answer, all these needles will work. Um, for me personally, out of those, 
the 0.35s, 0.3s and 0.25s. I personally use the 0.3s, which is the double zeros, because I think they're a happy medium between the bug pin and the standard, and they gave they, they give a nice um, compact um, look to the ink, especially packing black. Uh, as for mags versus curved mags, I always, always use curved mags. I, I, I don't use standard mags. Um, I think curved mags, they're a little bit harder to angle if you want, you know, to get that uh, really thin line if you're trying to edge them, but that's the only downside to them. Uh, but I think there's so many more upsides to curved mags than there is to downsides. Uh, one of the main plus uh, plus sides about a curved mag is the much less traumatic to the skin and they tend to put the ink in the skin a little bit easier than a standard mag just because of the way that they're shaped. So the next question is from Jared on Instagram. <laughs> Was video film an original passion before tattooing or was it developed because of tattooing? I've always been interested. I, I remember way back as a kid, I've always been interested in animation uh, and making, you know, little stories uh, and things like that. And when I was about, I think I was about 10 or 11, I got a Commodore 64 computer, if anyone remembers them, if anyone's old enough to remember them. Uh, and I started doing animation on those uh, and it, it was painstaking, but so much fun, especially back in the day, you know, um, when computers weren't really a massive thing. And I used to spend hours in my bedroom making these little animations. I remember for Christmas once my mum and dad bought me uh, a camcorder and I set it up and made a time-lapse uh, flick book. So I'd draw, you know, like hundreds of um, drawings and then time-lapsing, just taking pictures of each one and then running them all together on my camcorder. So I've always had uh, a, an interest in animation, but I suppose as I got older, um, obviously I lost touch with it. Uh, and then since doing my YouTube channel, I've had to relearn because obviously things have moved way on since a Commodore 64. So I've had to learn uh, new techniques and new uh, programs. But to answer your question, yeah, I've always um, had uh, a, a passion for animation and, and things like that. Next question is from Joshua Dwali. I'm a self-taught tattoo artist, so I've only used rotary machines. I've been looking into getting a nice coal machine, but I was wondering how often do you need to tune them? For example, would you only tune it once and the machine stay like it? Or would you need to tune it the same way before every tattoo? Now with my coal machines, um, once they're in tune, I, pr I probably give them a little tweak maybe once every month maybe every six weeks something like that certainly not every tattoo um, a decent quality call machine will will just stay in tune but eventually they will go out of tune eventually because the the, the spring tension on them starts to um, lose its tension and there can be a, a number of factors which involve uh, the machine coming out of tune but like I say if you've got a decent machine it should be when it does need tuning it's very very little tweaks and it's not very often at all next question is from she tells me i'm her king cool name which ink do you use and how much pressure should be applied to the client's body um i use um a a, a wide variety of inks, all top branded inks. I don't use any cheap inks, uh, but my go-to ones off the top of my head will be Dynamic, Eternal, Intense, World Famous, Silverback, Nocturnal, um, just to name a few. But basically I've got these top brands which I, I only really stick to what I know. So I've got these, um, a collection of top brands if you like, and then from them I'll just choose the exact colour which I need. So I don't necessarily say I only buy Eternal or I'll only buy Intense. I tend to buy what colour I need from that group of brands, if that makes sense. Uh, as for the pressure on the skin, um, it, it really varies. Um, the, the, again, the, there's so many different factors. Larger needle groupings tend to need slightly more pressure than smaller needle groupings. But trying to actually explain here right now on this video exactly how much pressure to put on the skin is virtually impossible, to be honest. So next question. This one's from Niv Kovi. I think I've said that right. I want to ask you a question about one specific video when you showed in depth how to tune a coal machine. You recommended to set the CPS to 130 and the duty to 50%. I did. I have managed to do so, but once I loaded the machine with the grip and the needle, the CPF dropped quite significantly to around 110 and the duty also dropped 
not as much, but to around 48 to 49%. Is this normal? And if not, what do you recommend do? Now, I should have mentioned in that video, and I've I've had really, really similar questions actually on the comments section on that video. Um, basically, when I tune a machine, I always tune it unloaded. By that, I mean I don't have the grip attached to it, I don't have the needle attached to it. And the reason that I tune it unloaded is because it's a lot easier when you're swinging the armature bar back, you know, when you're doing making all these adjustments to get your duty right. If you've got the needle on attached to it and everything, and the needle bar attached to the armature bar, uh, every time you have to make this adjustment, you have to take it all apart, then swing it out, and it's just, it, it takes so much longer doing it that way. So I always tune the machine unloaded, just for efficiency's sake. But you are absolutely right. You are, th those figures that I gave you, uh, 130 cycles per second and 50% duty, you are aiming for those when the machine is loaded. So even though I tune the machine unloaded, you want to be aiming for those figures when your machine is loaded. So what I do is I, I tune my machine unloaded, I get those figures, get in the right ballpark, and then I find when I do load the machine, I do attach the, the, the needle bar, the figures only um, decrease slightly. Like yours, have you say there that your duty went down to 48 to 49%, uh, and your CPS dropped to 110. So it's just a matter of just making really slight adjustments from there on once your machine's loaded, and it should, you know, if you just, nip that contact screw down a little bit uh bring that cps up and then you should be running with your machine fully loaded and hitting those figures but yeah you're absolutely right try and hit those figures whilst your machine is loaded next question is by mario portilla probably a boring question well let's read it first mario what do you think about the dragon hawk extreme rotary machine I'm waiting for mine in the mail, but can't find any good reviews. Um, I've never used one, to be perfectly honest. I've never used a Dragon Hawk Extreme Rotary Machine. Um, when you say you can't find any good reviews, does that mean you can only find bad reviews, or does that mean you just you can't find any reviews? Um, to be honest, I, I have heard of them, but I've never used one, so I can't really comment on that. But um, if you have used it, uh, drop a comment and let me know how you got on with it. Next question. This one's from Gavin Hobbins. I'm self-training and have been around for about a year now. I have numerous people asking for work, but haven't made the transition from practice skin to real skin yet. My excuse is I'm waiting to be able to pull consistent lines before going in real skin. Should I keep putting them off or give them what they want? I want to do them justice for having faith in me. Well, Gavin, the transition from practice skin to real skin is quite a big leap. It definitely was for me. Now you're absolutely right by putting those jobs off. Um, and I would recommend that if you do not feel confident uh, to go onto real skin, don't go onto real skin. Just stay on the practice skin until your confidence level rise up because it sounds like you get in there, but you're not quite there. And the reason I tell you to hold off on this is because if you just make the plunge and go to real skin, it can have um, a detrimental effect to your progress because if you tattoo someone and it turns out really, really bad, it might actually even put you off from picking up a tattoo machine ever again. So my advice would, you, uh, my advice would be is to stay on the practice skin until that confidence gets to a level where you know um, that design that you've been practicing on the practice skin, you can confidently put on a person's skin. I will also say as well, when you go onto actual skin, it's a really good idea to tattoo yourself first. Your first ever tattoo on real skin really should be on yourself. Uh, the main reason it takes off a hell of a lot of pressure because at the end of the day, if it does go wrong or it doesn't go quite to plan, it's on you, it's on your skin. Uh, and at the, the very, you know, at the very worst, it's just gonna be a reminder of the beginning of your tattoo journey. But if you put that on someone else and then, you know, they start bitching about it and start kicking off, telling people that you know good, um, it, it, can, it can do loads of damage before you even get off the ground. So next question is from day one. 
got two questions here. First question is, what was the biggest lesson you feel like you personally learned on skin that really helped propel your mindset with skin and ink confidence forward? It's a really good question. I think the biggest lesson that I learned um, whilst tattooing, which gave me confidence uh, and the ability to move forward with my work, was knowing how to correctly um, read the skin and how to adapt um, when you're tattooing. And what I mean by that is, everybody's skin is different. Literally no two people's skin are the same. Um, I've had clients before where they come for matching tattoos, you know, like friendship tattoos and things like that. And you can tattoo one person and then, you know, their tattoo, it's going in like, just like drawing Sharpie on a piece of paper. Uh, and then you go to the next person, exactly the same design, and then you're really struggling to get the ink in or the skin's raising up or things like that. Where the confidence comes here is being able to read the skin and not only read the skin, but able to adapt after you've read the skin. So let's say someone's starting to go red really quick, then you know to leave that area and go to another area and try and work out what's going on down there whilst you're working here. Uh, and you've got all these things going on all the time. You get some people where you pull a line and despite hitting the right depth, uh, the skin just doesn't like this. Some people's skin, it doesn't happen often, but uh, you get skin that's like, it's like tattooing a, a a sheet of silicon almost and the, the ink just doesn't want to go in um, so when stuff like that happens again you got to know how to adapt and tattooing when you look at it like this it's almost like you're problem solving you're constantly solving problems whilst um, you're tattooing actually on the skin and you're thinking right that doesn't work so I'm gonna do this now because uh, I know let's say when the skin acts this particular way I know what to do to combat it so to answer your question, the biggest thing I've learned um, to propel me forward with confidence is to be able to um, confidently read the skin. Next question, I feel like it's such a dedication, a passion, a love and almost a molecular binding obsession tattooing. Would you have any advice on family, on the family dynamic, like on how to balance the crazy obsession with the manacle hours working at and for the craft? I really value your perspective as someone who puts so much goodwill and spirit back into the industry. Um, massive, massive balancing act. I mean, I have a studio, so I run a business. Uh, obviously, I'm a YouTuber as well. Um, and I have uh, a wife and two children as well as dogs. So it can be um, a massive balancing act. I think it's really easy when you're passionate about something to get carried away with it and to get lost with it. I think the only way I manage to juggle all these different things is to really manage my time well uh, and set dedicated time by for a specific um, job. So for YouTube, uh, for tattooing, um, for taking my kids out, you know, playing with them uh, and just trying to manage that time. And it can be hard and it can be a balancing act. And sometimes you have to take a step back because you can be so involved in one thing like tattooing because it does take up so much of your time and if you're not careful you can blink and you know a week's gone by uh, and you've not really looked up at anything else so it's just finding that time and managing that time and being aware that there are other things going on and ultimate behind all of it is finding that time for your family because because although tattooing is very very time consuming um, if you're going to do it properly um, and amongst other things, YouTube, again, is very time consuming. Um, it's, it's always important to take a step back sometimes and just check in with everything else and make sure that you are spending that time and getting that quality time in with your family as well. Because, I mean, I don't know if you've got kids or not, but um, you literally blink and your kids are teenagers. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to get, to, to, to get that balance. Uh, and the way I get that balance is by not sleeping a lot. Um, so currently I'm making this video for YouTube and the time is 3.21 a.m. in the morning. So I'm sat here doing this video at uh, say nearly half past three in the morning. Uh, wife and kids are in bed uh, asleep and I'm here making this and then time I've made this video, uh, I go to bed, I'll probably be up in a couple of hours because it's the weekend, it's Saturday today. Uh, and then I'll be, 
playing with my kids and doing the family thing. So if you really, really do need to find time, you can find it. Uh, in my case, it's the early hours of the morning. <laughs> Next question. Jensen Graylin, do you have any other interests outside tattooing? I have had a lifelong love affair with guitars. Um, I started playing guitar when I was about 14 years old. Uh, I was in a couple of bands as a teenager in, in my early 20s. Um, and I just love guitars. I, I could literally fill my house with them. I can't get enough of them. So yeah, I've got um, a, a really big passion for electric guitars, acoustic guitars, any guitars. Next question from Laura Griffiths. I've recently started moving into tattooing from cosmetic tattooing. My technique is fairly strong. My concern is the stencil stage. I've watched many videos, including yours, but I'm still struggling. I'm using Procreate to get the image, then tracing over it. Then again, with carbon paper. The stencil transfer paper I have is really rigid and really tricky to get flush around the skin. Also, I'm not sure how to cut the transfer paper to make it bend on the head. For example, pieces of paper just lift and I get a crappy stencil do I need a thermal printer? Which is the best transfer paper to use and how do I cut it when ready to place on the skin? So you mentioned you're using transfer paper which is quite rigid. I don't really know any rigid transfer paper so maybe this is just a super quick and easy fix uh, and to change your stencil paper. Personally I use um, inkjet stencils so i have an eco tank printer which is an epson eco tank printer and i fill it up with um, inkjet ink and i literally print out my stencils like that and the paper is super super thin it's like really fine tracing paper so i think if you were to use a paper like that especially going around like the face area you'll probably get um, much better results than you're already getting. As for cutting your stencils, just put slits in your stencil. There's not really a great deal to it, to be honest. Um, I try to avoid cutting through the actual design when I can, uh, because obviously if you cut through the design and then you bend the paper, you're gonna have a big gap in your stencil, which you're gonna have to then link up. So where you can, try not to cut your stencil, but if you do have to cut your stencil, try and cut it in a place that's um, not gonna make too much of a problem when you're tattooing. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, just uh, try to change your stencil paper. Maybe give inkjet stencils a, a try. I mean, I don't know your budget, but a full setup uh, printer and ink, you're probably looking at about 400 pounds, something like that. So next question is from Akira May. So I'm here new to tattooing, but when you fill the black and finish in gradient, what are you doing near the end for the light part? Do you use dilution or only black at the end? Right, okay, so I think I'm pretty sure I know what you mean. So what you mean is, so let's say you're tattooing a rectangle shape, say, and you want it black one end, and then it's making a nice gradient transition into light at the other end. You're asking, do you just use black all the way through, or do you use a combination of black and grey wash? The answer is, it depends on how um, light the, the gradation is going to be. So if it's quite a dark gradation, so you've got black here and you go into just a slightly lighter black at the very end, then you'd probably just use the black all the way through it. Uh, because even shading with black, it doesn't necessarily go in jet black. It, it will um, give you a, a shade of black. But on the flip side of that coin, if you're going from black to really, really light, then I'd probably start with black and then start going down the grey washers. So I'd use a really dark one, then a medium one, then a light one. Um, quite simple to do, but yeah, just drop through the grey washers. Next question is from The Mighty. Do you have a go-to machine you use and is there really a machine out there that beats all the others? I just want to know before I spend my money. My go-to machine is the Cheyenne Pen, but it's by no means the machine. I don't think there is a a go-to machine it's all down to personal preference and what works for you at the end of the day i could probably use a chinese clone machine and do a half decent tattoo with it and there's a misconception where people think if they spend lots and lots of money on a certain machine it's going to make them an amazing artist uh, and all the machine will do is make your job a little easier but it won't make your work better, if that makes sense. Um, just makes your job easier. As for choosing a machine, 
just find what works for you, stick to it, and then make it work for you. So next question is from Amy Cutter. When did you know you had the confidence to open your own studio? Was it a definitive moment or was it a gradual progression? I'll tell you a secret, Amy. I still don't have the confidence to own my own studio. I don't think I ever will. I, I, obviously, I do own my own studio, but... Um, to, to say, to, you know, to, to have the confidence to, to I think once you, once, you reach a, once you reach a certain level and you're confident enough to tattoo, then it's, uh, it's just a matter of biting the bullet and making that progression. It's always gonna be nerve wracking, but sometimes in life you've got to take chances and that's what I did anyway. Uh, there was never a, a stage where I thought, right, you know, I'm, I'm full of confidence, I'm bursting with confidence, I'm gonna open this studio and I'm gonna smash everything. Um, it just, well, it didn't work like that for me anyway. Um, I was really, really nervous, loads of sleepless nights. On the day of opening, I was just a nervous wreck. I felt sick to my stomach, all sorts of horrible emotions. I can't say I've, I've ever had the confidence to uh, say I've been confident enough to open a studio, but sometimes in life you just gotta take a chance and that's what I did. So next question is from Triple Stakes. I'm just starting out and hopefully trying to build a successful YouTube channel. Do you have any advice on how to become a successful YouTuber and how I can gain subscribers? I think with YouTube, it's definitely not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, nothing with YouTube happens overnight. Well, very rarely does for people anyway, certainly not for me. Uh, it's took years and years and years um, slowly building and what YouTube tends to do is once it starts to gather momentum it'll start to snowball uh, and your subscribers will um, you'll start gaining more in a shorter space of time but in the beginning it's really hard um, I didn't ever think I'd reach a hundred subscribers and that is genuine I genuinely mean that I, I never thought I'd reach a hundred subscribers so we're uh, to be sat with at the moment I think about 25,000 amazing because I think stuff like that doesn't happen to me so if I can do it literally anyone can and I'm not just saying that I, I genuinely mean that literally anyone can do it you just got to have persistence patience and that's about it as for content, you've got to want to make people watch your video and be interested in your videos. So this is why I don't upload daily because my videos take so long to make with the animation and stuff. Sometimes it can take weeks to make. So I try to, every single upload, try to be um, something worth watching. Uh, and I think if you consistently have good content, then your channel will flourish and grow naturally on its own, rather than trying to just kick out stuff daily, uh, which doesn't hold much weight. So um, that's how I did it anyway. Next question is from Andrea Simmons. I'm sure you've had many highs throughout your tattoo career, but have you had any particular lows? I'm only asking as I seem to experience more lows than highs. This is, <laughs> it's gonna change the tone of the video a bit now, but um, you've asked the questions, I've, I said I'd answer your questions. I did have um, a, a very big low at the beginning of my tattoo career, and that came with um, losing my dad. My dad, um, he, he, he knew my, my goal, my dream, and he always supported me. You know, I, I used to go around and, and, and show him my drawings and things like that, and, um, Unfortunately, he, um, he, he got ill. Jeez. <laughs> what are you doing to me? Um, yeah, he, he, he got ill um, and he, he, was, he, he got ill pretty quick. And um, unfortunately, uh, he died um, before uh, he got a chance to... <clears throat> <clears throat> unfortunately, he died before... Um, he got a chance to see me open my studio um, and that was um, a, a, a massive low point for me. Um, you know, for, um, for, for something you've been working at um, for, for so long and then you, you want to share that with, obviously with your loved ones, with your mum and dad. And for him not to see the the end result, if you like, it was, um, yeah, it was hard. It, it, it was really hard. That was um, definitely the my, my biggest low point, if you like. Okay, I'm back in the room. So let's finish off with a final question from Saria Bakshi. 
This is a little off topic, but can I ask, are you religious? And if so, what faith are you? I'm not religious at all. I'm afraid to say. I've got no problem with people that are religious. It's just my personal preference. I'm, I've, I've not got a religious bone in my body. And the reason being, this is going to sound really controversial, but from what I've seen for myself with my own eyes, religion tends to cause a lot of wars and deaths. And I tend to, I, I believe in people and I believe in being nice to people and I believe in karma. And I believe if you're nice to people and you do good things, uh, good things will come back to you. So that's what I believe in. I believe in being nice. <laughs> so that's all there is for this video, guys. If you have liked it, it means the world to me. If you just smash that like button and just let me know that you've liked it. I will be doing another one of these Q&As if it does well. Um, let me know what you thought about it. Let me know if your name got mentioned. Drop your comments in the box below. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Click the notification bell to stay up to date with all my latest videos and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers guys.